check out Venezuela, Nigeria, Angola, and Iraq. The list goes on. They're all oil-cursed nations. But this is Norway, one of the largest oil-producer nations in the world. Having oil is more of a blessing than a curse. What did Norway do differently? How did they successfully manage their oil wealth? This is how Norway has avoided the syndrome of oil curse. In fact, Norway is hardly the only significant oil producer that is committed to preserving democracy and reducing corruption. This includes Canada and the United States. However, it may be the only one to avoid squandering or abusing its oil fortune. As an example, both Alberta and the United Kingdom placed their oil revenues in sovereign wealth funds. But that's the extent of their shared characteristics. While $18 billion may sound like a lot of money, it only works out to around $4,000 per Albertan. See, a whopping $1.3 trillion has been set aside in Norway's fund. That works up to an average of $245,000 for each of the 5 million Norwegian population. This means that every single Norwegian would be able to quit their jobs and live carefree for roughly 8 years if all the money was allocated equally. But how has Norway managed to defeat big oil producers in a way that neither Canada nor the United States have been able to do? Norway has enacted some policies to totally stay off corruption. There are two strong reasons why oil doesn't corrupt Norway, which I would discuss henceforth. But before I proceed, it's important to know how oil was even discovered in Norway. When oil and gas deposits on the Norwegian continental shelf began to be discovered in the late 1950s, very few people believed it. According to a letter written by Norway's geological survey, there is little prospect of finding coal, oil, or sulfur on the continental shelf off Norway's coast. A new perspective on the North Sea's hydrocarbon potential was provided by the discovery of Groningen, a gas field in the Netherlands, in 1959. As early as October 1962, Philips Petroleum requested authorization to conduct exploring activities in the North Sea from the Norwegian government. As a condition for a license to operate in Norwegian territorial waters, the company offered $160,000 USD per month for the North Sea areas that were or would be recognized as part of the Norwegian continental shelf. This was seen as an attempt by the firm to secure exclusive rights. The government judged that it was inconceivable to transfer over the entire continental shelf to a single corporation. In order for these topics to be explored, additional companies would need to get involved. Norway's average oil extraction rate was 45%, compared to the global average of 25%, thanks to Farouk al Qasim, an Iraqi petroleum geologist employed as a consultant by the Norwegian Ministry of Industry. al Qasim pressured the government to boost extraction rates. He kept insisting that companies should try new technologies like horizontal drilling or water injection in chalk reservoirs, and challenged to revoke operating permits from any corporation that didn't comply. It was still required to clarify the delineation of the continental shelf's boundaries, especially with Denmark and the UK, notwithstanding Norway's declaration of sovereignty over extensive sea regions. According to the median line principle, the continental shelf was defined in March 1965 in accordance with international agreements. Many mineral-rich and oil-producing countries in developing nations have had poor economic performance, poverty, and other problems, which has led to the creation of odd titles for the exploration and development of natural resources, such as the oil curse or the Dutch disease. Every country's shortcomings, on the other hand, can be explained. Corruption, weak institutions, colonialism, the influence of foreign investors, history, and many other factors have been blamed for the condition. These issues should be discussed, but the focus will be on how policymakers, professionals, and members of society's socio-economic classes think and what they hope to accomplish when it comes to developing and implementing natural resource management policies. To put it another way, the vast majority of governments in emerging nations are scrambling for cash to deal with immediate problems at the expense of future generations. Paul Kagam, the chair of the African Union and president of Rwanda, stated the same thing saying that Africa's greatest challenge is the mindset, not cash. To put it another way, this means that even the available resources in cash and most crucially the people are mismanaged, and so the urgent need to fix the core basics of the system is needed. It's important to remember that the citizens are the backbone of any economy, 
and that most natural resource extraction activities are profitable. It was in 1962 that Philip Petroleum indicated an interest in Norway's oil exploration license after the discovery of oil in neighboring Netherlands, which led to an increase in energy consumption from imported petroleum and coal. However, here are Norway's efforts to avoid corruption as a result of its oil wealth. Number 1. Norway has a law that ensures the resources belonging to the state. Norway's stable, affluent, and equitable economy and high level of living are largely due to the fact that petroleum was not discovered until long after the country had already established them. Several decades prior to 1969, when the first oil field was discovered in the Norwegian continental shelf, public institutions had established robust checks and balances, as well as democratic accountability. In fact, the National Geological Survey didn't even think the Norwegian oil shelf had oil until 1958. To assert control over its continental shelf, Norway issued a Declaration of Independence on May 1, 1963. As a result of passing a new law, all of Norway's natural resources are now considered state property and can only be granted exploration and production licenses by the monarch, in practice, the government. Initially, Norway wanted to clarify the legal framework so that licenses could be provided. International oil corporations were invited and clearly informed at the outset of the regulatory frameworks. Norwegian Trade Minister Jens Evensen once said that he conveyed an unambiguous statement to every party interested in accessing the Norwegian continental shelf during his tenure as minister during the 1970s. He said, We want Norwegian control. We will make the rules. We will listen to you, but we will have a license system that you must follow. That's how it is. Anyone who doesn't accept these terms can go home. In Norway's oil and gas sector plan, this statement is seen as one of the driving principles. As a result of this policy, the long-term profitability of natural resource extraction will be ensured, the government will receive a larger share of the money, and the population will benefit greatly from the extraction of natural resources. The worst manifestation of the resource curse was avoided in Norway by strong procedures that were put in place in the 1960s. Norway is consequently an example of state capitalism, with government holdings in critical industries including telecommunications, energy, mining output, and financial services such as Satoil, Norway's largest oil company. Number 2. Trust – Ensured Norwegians' Trust for the Government The values of ethical awareness in Norway are reflected in the country's transparency. This is crucial because it encourages both policymakers and average citizens a sense of personal accountability for doing the right thing when it comes to managing the Earth's natural resources. For Norway, this means no spending bonanza. Only 4% of the fund's surplus is allocated to public initiatives, and this role is strictly adhered to. When it comes to saving money, there are several reasons why Norway does not want to be tempted by the pleasures of the high life. You must have a high level of trust in order for this type of system to succeed. Don't worry about how the money is going to be spent, just trust that it won't be misused. Social democracy and equitable policies have created a unified society characterized by a high level of mutual trust. The Norwegian parliaments issued a series of 10 oil commandments back in 1971, which have since guided the country's natural resources strategy. Norway's Sovereign Wealth Fund was created in 1990 to ensure that Norway's current government natural resource revenues might be used for the benefit of future generations, to prevent the economy from heating up through foreign investment, and to lessen Norway's significant reliance on volatile natural resource revenues. Originally, the government's Ministry of Finance allocated money to the fund in 1996. At a capital market value of roughly $1.3 trillion USD in assets in 2020, this fund is recognized as the world's largest sovereign wealth fund. During exploration and development of natural resources, many countries have seen an increasing divide between the rich and the poor populations, a diminishing middle class, and broken communities. The World Economic Forum WEF, says that an average GDP per capita of $44,656 in the world's top developed economies is nothing to Norway's outstanding GDP per capita of $89,741. Norway's rankings show that the private sector is still competitive and most crucially, that the Progressive Human Development Index is a comprehensive measure of state welfare despite the presence of a large state-owned oil business. As a result, Norway's natural resources now serve as a blessing rather than a curse, 
thanks to the innovative strategies and policy enacted in this country. If you enjoy the video, kindly leave a like and subscribe to support the channel. Until the next one, stay safe!